there is one particular feeling um, that captures the uh, starting point of 3D modeling rather well, and also we feel this every day, even now, having done this for a couple of years. And that's the feeling of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because logically speaking, uh, the surest way to success is to lower your ambitions. But uh, don't do that. Uh, keep at it and go at it again and take use, you know, use your friends if you know fellow sketchers or modelers, use the forums, the internet and so on, and keep at it and try and try again. So today we will talk about classical architecture first, then show you some samples of um, structures we have built, everything 100% to sketch up, and then explain in some detail how to model these structures in the best way. And we will end with questions from the audience, so we're very happy to answer your questions after the presentation. So right, Anders, what is that classical architecture? Okay, thank you, Anders. Uh, <laughs> Classical architecture is uh, everywhere. The building we're sitting in, sitting in now is classical in form. Large part of London is classical, and so are considerable parts of the, uh, Europe and the rest of the world. And once you learn how to read the language of classical architecture, it's prose and poetry, if you will, uh, you have for the rest of, the li of your life a, an endless source of, of joy just walking around and you know, taking in and understanding a little better what you see. So, but historically speaking, classical architecture is a way of building structures based on a tradition which is uh, more than two and a half millennia old. The oldest classical column, column is about 2,700 years. Now, late Bronze Age Greeks, they developed built forms from Egypt and the Near East into uh, an autonomous language of expression we know as classical architecture. And this Greek invention was later adopted and expanded by the Romans who uh, recognized the superiors in the domain of art, the Greeks. Uh, so they copied and expanded. And the fall of the Roman Empire, um, it was the first dark period for classical architecture. And it, um, from the Italian Renaissance, say the 1400s and onwards, it quickly gained speed and became synonymous with architecture itself, if you were serious. And it was a title it kept until, well, into, well, into the ninth, uh, 19th century. So, that's it for history. So, what is classical architecture per se? Well, all classical architecture shares three things. A vocabulary of forms, and we look at these the building blocks, we'll look at these later. Uh, a grammar of composition, uh, the way you're allowed to put these together, because you can't just top, topple e anything on top of anything. Uh, there are certain rules for this. And suffice it to say that whereas modernism demands great talent to really come alive, classicism has built in rules of composition that make even mediocre architects uh, able to produce fair results provided that they follow the rules. So I believe that today the problem is not so much bad modern modernists as bad classicists because they don't follow the rules, they haven't read the book. And the third part is intended spiritual or psychological, if you will, effects. And classical architecture wants to establish a center. You can sense it in this uh, image by uh, uh, an Italian pastor. Um, and a sense that the center is, in a way, it sounds contradictory to us, but I think they thought in this manner, or felt in this manner, that the center is everywhere. Also, it wants to remind us that we have dignity as human beings. So there is a social or moral element here, because classical architecture never degrades, never debases, never equalizes, but always points to a kind of vertical. So what can it do? This is sort of people's maybe the most common conception of classical architecture, naked bell men building pristine temples in ancient Greek, in Greece. And uh, there's something to this, but uh, there's much more. Look at this, for example. This is Euston Arch, uh, quite close to here. It was torn down in the 50s. Uh, and you can just, just going to show you some pictures to get a mood of what classical architecture can express. 
So here's a Greek Doric order. You can feel the heaviness uh, and sort of majesty of this of this uh, Doric portal. Here's a completely different take, but it's still classicism. This is a Rococo interior from Fields and Heiligen in Germany by Balthasar von Neumann. Very festive and glad, sort of. Or you can be stark and minimal, as in this uh, uh, interior. Or you can overdo it, as uh, Garnier did in his Paris opera. This is a capital from uh, the staircase there. Or you can be very subdued and, and subtle, like in this Greek revival barn, which was turned into a uh, school for girls. It's from the United States, where Greek the revival was uh, came to its peak, I believe. Here's a French chateau as they come, you know, crisp and um, and uh, elegant. Or you can be moody and uh, like this in this London <coughs> alleyway. Or you can be jocular, like in this uh, building from Italian Bomazzo, intentionally built as if it were toppling over, uh, as a sort of architectural joke. So, and classical architecture as an intimate relationship to sculpture, and I believe the sort of serene beauty of this Tête Kaufmann from the Louvre is one part of it, and another part is the terror of the Rondanini Medusa. So these two aspects, the beauty and terror, uh, provide a key to understanding uh, what classical architecture wants to do with us. And here's an image of the five orders of architecture. These are the building blocks. So you have from uh, left to right, you have Tuscan, you have Doric, you have Ionic, you have Corinthian, and you have uh, Composite. So, and note two things. First, the rising degree of slenderness as we go up the orders. Uh, and second, the rising degree of geometrical complexity, which also make them harder to model. Uh, so, uh, how, do you, how do you make these things? Well, it's really quite simple, because simple curves build everything. You have some very simple curves, like for example an, uh, an ovalo, looks a little bit like this, like an egg. You've got a cavetto, which is a hollow, a little bit like this or you have its uh, positive counterpart, part, uh, half round, and you have the kaima, which uh, looks a little bit uh, like this. Kaima is French, it means wave, uh, uh, Greek, it means wave, so you can see this wave-like uh, form. We can do the inverse, which is called OG in English. Looks like this. So, and, it, and there are some more curves, but not many. And with these eight or ten curves, you can combine them and you'll have a classical molding. And what do you do with that? Well, you sweep it. You sweep it along, for example, a circle. This is supposed to be a circle. And <laughs> you can sweep it uh, uh, on a square, or you can do a combination, for example, a half square with a small circle, half circle, like this. Can you see? Can everybody see? Yes. yes. Good. Thanks. And if you put like six columns here in the front, you have the beginning of what is the White House in Washington. <laughs> so it's really quite simple. So, Anders. Yes, and before uh, we explain the principles and practice of accurate 3D modeling, uh, we would like to present some structures we've built. Uh, first of all, we always use uh, canonical classical parts. Uh, columns and tablatures and ornaments, and we model these from the highest quality sources, and that is old books from the 16th or 17th, 13th century. An idea to start with is uh, Vignola's Canon of the Five Orders, and we then combine these canonical parts into brand new compositions of our own. So let's take a look at uh, some of them. Yes, so remember, all the parts are historical, and uh, we've copied them exactly, but the compositions are our own. So let's start here. This is a simple uh, Tuscan portal. So you've got the Tuscan order, and uh, as you can see, you can't really do anything with this. Uh, and uh, that is uh, something all our structures have in common. Uh, they're non utilitarian. Here is a small uh, garden temple, and you can't even hide from the rain because it's a hypethral temple, which means that uh, it doesn't have a roof. This was our first model, we'll come back to that later. Here's a spiral staircase. Uh, to achieve this, we used Flowify, and we'll show you that in a moment. It's a plug-in. 
Here's a uh, double volute, it's a bracket, so it's supposed to sit on top uh, or at a facade, perhaps holding something up. And uh, this uh, bracket uh, uh, is here seen by itself. Here's a tiled dome. Here's the uh, uh, right on the same theme, it's a, the, a tiled dome on a rusticated garden temple with a small podium. Uh, staircases and a uh, balustrade going around. There are two flaming urns, and everything we show is 100% uh, built in SketchUp. Sometimes we use renderers uh, to visualize, but everything is modeled in SketchUp and SketchUp only. And here's the temple, and this is an exploded view, so we've taken away the walls in order to peek inside. We'll look at this later as, as well. So, Anders, where are we coming from? Well, we do this as enthusiasts, so today we just want to share our knowledge. But that said, if anyone here is interested in our professional services, uh, please let us know. We'll see if we can help. But, uh, yes, we are interested in collaborations and yeah. uh, <coughs> commercial projects as well. So, our project started two years ago with a drawing uh, Felix had made, and he asked me uh, whether we could model it in 3D. And I had, at the time, some very, uh, very limited experience in 3D modeling. So this uh, Apple grinder uh, was uh, my, uh, and that's a piece of machinery for cider making, was my only model up to that point. But, uh, however, I have a background in, uh, in programming and uh, computational geometry, so I was new, not new to 3D as such, but uh, and we thought it would be easy to make a temple in a week or so. And in fact, our first model took like half a year, not full time. But, uh, uh, but and 3D modeling is, uh, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, in part because it is very hard, and in, in part because of uh, self expansion. Yes, Anders, maybe we should add some, um, and then you go on, like adding details here and there, and then you never, you know, you, you never done. Uh, so, uh, yes, so we've never asked, is this possible to model in SketchUp? Instead, we imagined a specific form and pushed SketchUp to its limits. And where SketchUp's native tools, i.e. the built-in tools you get, uh, or available plugins uh, did not suffice, we built our own. Guys, do you want an image on the screen? Or? Uh, we, uh, Sorry. You, you get a picture very soon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see more pictures, you'll get more pictures. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you. Uh, okay, so our, our, our goal is to eventually give our models some, some kind of physical existence. And this underpins most of our basic modeling assumptions because 3D printing or CC writing requires uh, solid models. And this goal of solidity uh, has been driving our work uh, from the start, and it really has led to greater geometrical discipline and better modeling practice. So we're going to go, go over some of our technical criteria for the models. And the, the first criterion is 100% uh, solids. And what is a solid? Well, a solid is when you have all your geometry in one single uninterrupted shell. So uh, you think of it as an eggshell. It's watertight. There are no holes, no stray lines, and no planes sticking out single planes. So uh, it's watertight. And this is a rigid criterion. Everything we model is 100% uh, 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 solid. And you can check the entity info window. You click on a group or component. We'll say group, uh, but we mean group or component. Uh, you click on, click on a group, and you check the entity info window, and it says whether it's solid or not. Right. Yes, and a precise alignment. And that is, no, uh, we, we don't want overlapping geometry. So if we have two solids that are supposed to be uh, exactly next to each other, they should really be next to each other. So basically, ver ver vertice to vertice. And no cheating. So, ge in some geometry-driven modeling, so no texturing, uh, because geometry <coughs> drives appearance. Geometry must be clean, it must be effective, and we use all available hacks to get to the ge geometry, but no hacks to substitute for geometry. Sometimes we use limited coloring, uh, uh, for you know visualization purposes, but that's it. And another criterion, or more, it's more good, good practice. We'll come into that very soon. It's to maximize details resolution. This is sort of a uh, rubber paragraph because what is maximized detail resolution is when SketchUp cannot take it anymore. So and, and so there tends to be a limit between maybe 20 and 30 million inches, somewhere around that. 
So, but we want to do everything uh, in maximize detail from the start. So we'll have some good practices to share. Yeah, so when we, when we model, we analyze the forms to be into smaller parts, and uh, the, the parts are limited by how, how they will be created. Like okay. a sweep here, or yes. a push pull there. And we okay. model them in separate solids in place, and finally combine them. And often we use, uh, as we see as another advice, multiple instances for this. Yeah, so componentize liberally, use components wherever uh, necessary. If you have two parts, it's supposed to look the same, always use a component. And as Anders said, we also use multiple instances and paste in place. So we never use place and uh, paste at all. We always use uh, paste in place. So you work on your master model and there's a detail you need to uh, change. So you uh, copy the detail, open a new instance of SketchUp, paste in place, do your modification, copy it and paste it back in, in place. More good practices? Well, start large scale. Uh, there is an inbuilt uh, limit on about one square millimeter in SketchUp. And if, if you want to maximize detail resolution, you're, you are very soon going to hit it if you start in, uh, in a natural scale. So, for example, our latest column is about 10 miles high. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds silly, but, but it works. It's, it's the only way if you, if you want to get a detail, because one square millimeter is uh, very large. So do you always scale up by a certain factor, or is it just yes, about a million or something? <laughs> uh, use uh, layers liberally, and uh, when you use layers, put all your groups, all the outermost groups, on layers, and only those groups within groups should not be put on layers because you won't be able to find them afterwards. And unclick your item icons. Remove all the icons, everything, and use shortcuts instead. And uh, use a shortcut for the shortcuts. So my advice is that you use, uh, if you click on a button five times in a session, you click it five times too many, and immediately go up and set up a shortcut for it, and use the shortcut in, instead. And if you don't do that, you'll end up with this. <laughs> so Anders, where's my model? Yeah, I can't, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an intriguing question. So let's illustrate these uh, principles. Right. And uh, we'll start with the Swedish almond cake, the Tosca Tonta, it's a pun, uh, you'll get it, uh, because uh, you're Swedish, but uh, it's not that much fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right, here's a drawing again that you saw, and uh, after we had been at it for uh, uh, some months, uh, it ended up looking somewhat similar. Let's see, there it is. So this is a fully expressed 3D uh, uh, temple in an orthogonal view. So you can see, fairly similar, similar. We wouldn't have built it this way today, not at all. But uh, to be our first model, it's okay. This is uh, a screenshot from the first day. You see, we uh, made a mistake of uh, still having you know, all these uh, 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 icons on top. We removed them since. And you can see to the left is a uh, detailed measured drawing by uh, the Frenchman Perrault of the Tuscan order, the Tuscan order, which is the simplest and the column which we managed to get up uh, on, on the first day. So, note here that the column, all classical columns have something called entesis, or swelling, and the bottom third is straight. And then, and I'll exaggerate this, the top two thirds, they go in like this, uh, in a non-linear fashion. And you need this because if it's straight, uh, the column looks completely dead. So we need to set out the entesis. And how did we do that, Anders? Well, this emphasis thing uh, provided us with an opportunity to make the script. And there were basically two reasons for this. First, we wanted to, in the future, emphasize even fluted columns, and they are not uh, symmetrical about the rotational axis, so you can't just draw a, uh, a curve and sweep it around. And also, we wanted to lay out the emphasis in a canonical fashion, because the, these are the books we use. And this is from Vignola. You can see he lays out his uh, emphasis with a cosine function. So we made a simple script to, to accomplish this. Yes. Uh, and here's an exaggerated view. Uh, and it, this script is not particularly uh, spectacular, but the fact that we were able to make a script that was, uh, did something useful for us uh, gave us a sense that scripting could be used as an extremely powerful uh, modeling tool. So we kept, uh, kept on scripting quite a lot. And uh, the next script we made uh, was uh, based on the fact that uh, and maintain, achieving and man maintaining solids turned out to be extremely difficult, and that was partly due to inexperience and partly due to lacking accuracy. 
But we wanted a script to help us achieve solids. So we wrote this script called Shellify, and it tries to extract the outer shell from an almost solid by removing so internal faces. So to the left you have a non-solid. Yes, and it, this is basically a cube, but there are two things preventing it from being a solid, and that is the, this external flap and uh, the internal window there. So what Shellify does is uh, just basically to walk around the, the geometry and it uh, throws away all things that prevents it from being a solid. And this was uh, published on Sketchucation, uh, but it is now incorporated into TomTom's uh, Solid Inspector 2. And Solid Inspector 2 is a great plugin, go get it. Solid Inspector 2. It, uh, if you have an uh, almost solid, it will ins inspect it and try to fix uh, errors. So, um, one of the main sources of non-solidity turned out, quite surprisingly, to be the Fornito. Uh, and classical architecture is, is to a great extent profiles swept around complicated curves. But Fornito does not handle wide profiles in tight corners very well. So, here you see the original curve. I don't know if you can see it. I think you can see. So, this is the original curve. You can recognize this perhaps from the uh, Swedish Ormond cake, the Garden Temple. And so this is where you want to follow me to, to go. And, but here, you need a profile. It starts here and ends here. And the profile is quite wide. It might look something like this or something like that. I don't know, something. And so if this point goes here and this point goes here, when you use follow me, the inner point will go here. And then, since the inner rail is uh, by definition with use, using uh, follow me and offset, the offset looks like this, and you see you get these strange loops here and here, and these strange loops, uh, they m mess it up. And you can see in the next picture what it looks like. You see? We're taking away the topmost plane here, but they really are solid except that. Uh, so here you see, you re re recognize the loop. And you see it's just a um, salad of uh, polygons. And yes, and this, this also turned extremely tedious to clean up. And there are also another case where, where you get a gap. Uh, so we, we wrote a new uh, follow me tool which solved these uh, special cases. And it's called uh, FollowFi. And what it does is just uh, it uh, constructs uh, a new offset curve so every point in the profile. And then it uh, removes the loops from, the, from these uh, offset curves, and, and it, and it stitch, stitches together the geometry from modified offset curves. And it handles all the cases uh, which uh, does it, or does it need planar? No, yeah, yes, and the, 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 rail, the rail needs to be planar also. Otherwise, if you have planar rails, it will handle all the cases that follow me does, plus many more. Yeah. And so you end up, instead of this, you get this. This is what you want. Right. What's next? No, oh, Fort Doris. Right, uh, again, we started with a quick, uh, with a sketch, and here's uh, the first day, the first hour or so. And in classical architecture, the plan always drives the elevation. So you have to start with the plan, and you have to do the measures. Measures, 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 and check them and check them again. Here you have the Doric order. We progressed in, the, uh, in, in, in this progression of orders. So, and here you see the mutules, which are the little brackets sticking out at the entablature. And these need to be set out at regular intervals, like this. Otherwise, it won't be boring, it won't be, it will be a, I don't know, a salad. So, uh, you need to check your measures very carefully and do the plan. You see here, if you don't do that, co columns will start crashing into each other. These columns won't crash because they're carefully set out. Here you see a sort of uh, uh, vanity shot. Uh, we're getting there, and uh, you see we've got some more walls up. And combining fog, this is just a SketchUp export. Combining fog and sun makes for uh, some effects. Getting closer, and finally uh, the end result. Should we try and open this in SketchUp? Yes. We can. We can. We can try. Let's see what happens. Uh, us. So while yes. we're waiting for SketchUp to load, maybe you can crack a joke or something. Yes. <laughs> so here, here we have the uh, full express model. Everything here is 3D, so no texturing or anything. You can peek inside like this. 
What's the file size on that model? Uh, the file size of uh, this is uh, 90 megabytes, like this. You can get a peek here at the entrance. So, so is he, we're serious about de detail. If you peek inside, you can see the courtyard here, and this ridiculous structure here. To make it place a statue or something. Turn around. We can glimpse the uh, spiral staircases mm -hmm. here. So this is uh, this is just for fun, uh, but it, it can be imagined this as a fortress. And uh, are all the carvings in the frieze? Yes, yes, they are. Uh, they are. They are two and a half deep. Yes, uh, they're two and a half deep. We tried subdividing them, but uh, we didn't like the results, so they look better like this. So yes, they. So it's basically just push pull to get the 3D yes. effect. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you apply them to a curved surface like that in a courtyard, uh, do you take the original, say, the triglyph or the bucranium and then curve it? We, we will show you how to do that soon. So, uh, and uh, you can see the, the plan is quite simple. It is a, uh, a square uh, with some offsets, and in the middle of the square you have a circle. So, I don't know, the general expression is sort of, sort of quite quasi baroque, and uh, but the sort of layout is maybe uh, new classicism, something like that. Right, let's go on. So the next model, what's that? That's uh, our Bolos, and that is a round temple. And this started out as a stacked version of the central font of Autorius, and it was sold in as a group project by virtue of being constructed from already existing parts. But it don't, did not turn out that way, uh, because the dangers of self-expansion. Maybe we should add a... Exactly. That's a real killer. <laughs> so here you have just a quick one minute sketch. And it turned out like this. So here you have a fully expressed 3D model uh, in perspective. Uh, right. And this presented us with some new challenges. Here's a view from, the, uh, from below onto the dome. Yes, we wanted a dome, and we wanted to model on the inside of a dome, and in this case we wanted about, I don't think this is like 1200 uh, fully expressed. <coughs> 3D stars, uh, and, and we also have these flaming urns, and we saw Renda shot of them before. Uh, so, so we wanted to have them smack on, so to speak, on the inside of the dome, and we, and we also wanted to create the dome in uh, with like stone blocks. Like yeah, that. mind that a dome is a doubly curved surface, exactly. so and we want these, uh, 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 one of these uh, urns is maybe a Hundred thousand polygons, and we want them smack on. We made it. We make cut them in half so they're flat, uh, and so they have one flat side. And this flat side, we wanted to smack on the doubly curved surface of the dome. And we searched the warehouse and we searched SketchUp to no avail. So yes, what we, we had at the time like, been dabbling a little bit with McNeil's Rhino, and there is a very nifty command called Flow Along Surface. And it uh, allows one, it, it, it allows these kinds of uh, modeling on bent surfaces. So we basically just copied this uh, this command, and it's called Flowify, and it, it is available both at Sketchication and, and Extension Warehouse. And the point is, it is often much, much, much easier to model axis aligned and then to to uh, Flowify the geometry onto a curved surface. So if we have a simple example, it's a kind of a tall city, but to the right you can see an axis aligned city, and it stands on a uh, it, it stands on a grid, and then we have a corresponding uh, grid over to the to the left. But this is a curved grid, but they have the same number of cells and the same uh, topology, so to speak. So this grid here is the original grid on which we model axis aligned, as we always do, uh, because that's much easier than you want, don't want to model this. Uh, uh, by hand because all the normals are going in different direction and normal is the, the, the perpendicular line to a surface. Exactly. So what flow paralysis does is like it projects uh, all the source geometry onto this flat uh, <coughs> flat source grid um, and then it recreates the geometry on, on the curved grid. So what you do is you create the original, you create uh, a flat uh, uh, grid, source grid and then you create a, a bent target grid, and it could look any any way that you want, as long as it's rectangular, that it has the same number of, of small uh, uh, points. As you can see, there's small 
on here. And then you, you select, and then you also draw connecting lines. So you select uh, the original, uh, the support groups and the original geometry, and just click on Shift F as in Flowify, because that's a shortcut. And then you end up with this a matter of seconds. Yes, uh, yeah, matter of quite a lot of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but the dome also had an outside, and we wanted to, to tile the dome. And the general problem with tiling is extremely difficult to solve. But we, so, so we, uh, we specialized. So we made a small script for tiling and ellipsoid. So this is, part, this is not part of a sphere. I think the, the height is about 85% 80, of the range. But we, the first part of this. It's 85% of the diameter. No, no, no. Not the radius. Okay. Uh, it's a squashed part. Okay, okay. Uh, anyways, uh, so the first part of the script uh, creates a, a, an ellipsoid with a very specific core geometry. So basically, basically we want a, a width height relationship uh, in the quad to be about 2 to 1. So every quad is going to receive a tile. And when we constructed this, we just select the master component here and the, the dome. And ev ev every tile on the dome, every quad on the dome receives exactly one tile. And there are also some random randomness in this. So the orientation and the size of the tile is slightly altered, and also the color. And that is to get a more uh, man made uh, feel to this. But we weren't really satisfied with, with this, and we uh, wanted to do something. Uh, more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went ionic, and this is the next step in the progression of the orders. If you're there, you're more than halfway through. We got inspiration from uh, Sir Robert Smirk's British Museum, not far away from here, like Trafalgar Pres Square, and he's using these uh, beautiful uh, ionic columns. You can recognize the volutes up here. Um, and where did he get this from? Well, he got it from here. This is uh, Athena's, Athena Pulaeus, a temple in uh, uh, Priene, uh, Ionia, <coughs> modern-day Turkey. This is a reconstruction made in, in 1769 by the Dilettanti. Uh, so we don't re 